Hi class, this is your instructor, Scholar Elf, and welcome to Chapter 23, Understanding Diversity. This is Systematics. So biologists estimate today that they have identified less than 15% of the terrestrial species and less than 10% of all marine species. So in other words, diversity abounds. Given that, let's get to classifying organisms. So it states that biodiversity is that variety of living organisms and the ecosystems in which they belong. So species are becoming extinct before researchers can even study them. And by that same token, systematics is the scientific study of the diversity of organisms and their evolutionary relationships. So biologists organize information about groups of organisms. And that's where we are now. So taxonomy is a science of naming, describing, and classifying organisms. And it is an important aspect of systematics. So in biology, the term classification means arranging organisms into groups based on similarities that reflect the evolutionary, the evolutionary relationships among lineages. For hundreds of years, scientists have realized that certain groups of organisms share many features. Saying something like species X is some kind of cat tells the person that species X falls somewhere between tigers and house cats. And it also suggests that species X has many features shared with other cats, ranging from details of a heart, skin, muscles, and skeleton, and then to molecular traits like amino acid sequences, in particular proteins and nitrogenous bases, sequences in DNA, and even to complex traits such as behaviors and aspects of their physiology. So after the work of Charles Darwin, we came to realize that organisms within such groups <clears throat> organisms within such groups share so many traits because they have all inherited those traits from the same ancestor. The living species are related to are related via shared ancestors, and the traits they share are homologous traits. And the moderns and the modern systematists seek to name and classify organisms according to their evolutionary relationships, and that is what a systematist does. So this work involves some careful investigations as we attempt to determine the patterns of relationships. In the mid-18th century, Carlos Linnaeus developed a system of naming organisms to allow scientists to communicate more clearly. We will discuss his contributions to the classification in the next section, but here we'll focus on his idea for naming species. So, before the mid-18th century, each species had a lengthy descriptive name, sometimes consisting of ten or more Latin words. Linnaeus simplified the scientific classification and developed the binomial system of nomenclature. That two-part name, I'll just leave it here for a moment. So again, I say binomial system of nomenclature, otherwise called binomial nomenclature, in which each species is assigned a unique two-part name. The first part of the binomial scientific name is a noun that designates the genus. Plural would be genera. And the second part is an adjective modifying that noun called the specific epithet. So we have the genus and that specific epithet, such as Quercus alba, the white oak. Quercus is the genus. Alba is the specific epithet. Or even Escherichia coli. Escherichia, genus, coli would be that specific epithet. Each of those represent the scientific names of each of those, one being a tree, one being a bacterium. So the genus, it is always capitalized. I see again the genus, it is always capitalized. I guess I'll go back a moment. That's why the Q is capitalized, and that's why the E is an eat is capitalized. Whereas the specific epithet, it is usually not capitalized. So both names are underlined, or in this case, you see that both names are italicized. Both are italicized. So the genus or generic name can be used alone to designate all species in the same genus. So you'd be referring to the genus Quercus for all of the oak species. Note that the specific epithet alone is not the name of the species. In fact, the specific epithet can be used as a second name of the species in a different genera. For example, Quercus alba is a scientific name for the white oak, whereas Salix alba is a scientific name for the white willow. Thus, both parts of the name must be used to identify the species accurately. 
The specific epithet is never used alone. It must always follow the full or abbreviated genus name, such as Quercus alba or Q, period, alba. Scientific names are generally derived from Greek or Latin roots or Latinized versions of the names of the person, places, or characteristics. For example, the generic name for the bacterium Escherichia coli is based on the name of the scientist Theodore Escherich, who first described it. The specific epithet coli reminds us that E. coli lives in the colon, the large intestine. So scientific names permit biology to be truly international, a truly international science. Even though the common names of organisms may vary in different locations and languages, an organism can be universally identified by its scientific name. So a researcher in Puerto Rico knows exactly which organisms were used in a study published by a scientist from, let's just say, Africa, and therefore can be repeated to extend the scientist's experiments using the same species. So each taxonomic level is more general than the one below it. Linnaeus devised a system for assigning species to a hierarchy of increasingly broader groups. As you move up the hierarchy, each group is more inclusive. That is, it includes the groups below it. When he set the system up, Linnaeus did not have a theory of evolution in mind, nor did he have an idea of the vast number of extant species, meaning the living species, and extinct organisms that would be later discovered. His system, nonetheless, ended up providing an important evidence for evolution. And although some substantial modifications have been necessary, Linnaeus's basic system still forms the framework for much of our modern classifications. The range of taxonomic categories, from species to domain, forms a hierarchy. And please see Table 231 and Figure 231. Closely related species are assigned to the same genus. Closely related genera are grouped into a single family, and families are grouped into orders, orders into classes, classes into phyla, and phyla into kingdoms, and kingdoms into domains. So a taxon, or taxa being plural, is a formal grouping of organisms at any given level, such as species, genus, or phylum. Today we realize that classifying organisms requires many classification levels, many more classification levels than envisioned by Linnaeus. So between any two categories, there could be additional levels. For example, order Coleoptera, which includes the beetles, contains more than 400,000 species. Yes, more than 400,000 species. And the class is divided into subclasses, with each subclass containing multiple infraorders, and each infraorder containing multiple superfamilies, and each superfamily containing numerous families. Sometimes even these additional levels are not sufficient to categorize important groups. Another difference between the current classifications and those Linnaeus is even more substantial. Linnaeus groups species into particular taxa because they share certain features. In the light of our modern understanding of shared ancestry, and evolution, we seek to place organisms in particular taxa because they share particular ancestry. For example, the modern, a modern biologist would place a species within the taxon Mammalia if all available evidence showed the species evolved from the same recent ancestor as the rest of the mammals. So this decision would not be based on whether or not members of the species had any one particular feature like hair or memory glands. So from the time of Aristotle to the mid-19th century, biologists divided organisms into two kingdoms, Plantae and Animalia. After the development of microscopes, it became increasingly obvious that many species could not be easily assigned to either plant or animal kingdom. For example, the unicellular organism, Eulina, was classified at various times in the plant kingdom and in the animal kingdom, but did not really fit either kingdom. Eulina carries on photosynthesis in the light, but in the dark, it uses for them to move about to search for food. So in 1866, a German biologist, Heikel, proposed that the kingdom Protista be established to accommodate bacteria and other microorganisms. <coughs> Excuse me. However, biologists largely ignored this kingdom for about 100 years. 
And then marine biologists, a French marine biologist, Chaton, suggested prokaryotique before nucleus to describe bacteria, and then eukaryotique true nucleus to describe all other cells. The distinction between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is now accepted by biologists. And it is that fundamental evolutionary divergence. Whitaker suggested that fungi be removed from the plant kingdom and classify it on, in their own kingdom, fungi. After all, fungi are not photosynthetic. They obtain their nutrition by absorbing nutrients produced by other organisms. And fungi are also different from plants in the composition of their cell walls, their body parts, and their modes of reproduction. Kingdom Prokaryote was established to accommodate the bacteria, which are fundamentally different from all other organisms in that they do not have distinct nuclei or other mem membranous organelles and do not undergo mitotic division. So thereafter, Carl Weiss of the University of Illinois and his colleagues began to study evolutionary relationships among organisms by analyzing genes coding for their ribosomal RNA using sequence analysis. So he used the variations in the universal molecule to challenge long-held views that all prokaryotes were closely related and similar, and very similar to one another. The analysis of ribosomal RNA is an important tool used by semesists. So he showed that there were two fundamental different groups of prokaryotes, archaea and bacteria. He and his colleagues proposed that not only that archaea are different from the bacteria, but also that archaea are genealogically more closely related to the eukaryotes than they are to bacteria. So given this, this is why we now have three domains of life. Domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya. So based on the molecular evidence, biologists now divide the prokaryotes into two major groups, bacteria and archaea. So Kingdom Protista has had an interesting history, and biologists placed euglena along with other unicellular organisms traditionally referred to as protozoa in Kingdom Protista. At various times, they have also assigned algae the water moles and slime moles of Kingdom Protista. Thus, this kingdom became a diverse group of mainly unicellular, mainly aquatic eukaryotic organisms. And in the past few years, systemicists have established that the protist groups did not descend from one recent common ancestor. We'll get to that in chapter 26. So, most biologists have even abandoned Kingdom Protista and now assign the eukaryotes to five supergroups based on molecular data, and I will introduce you all to supergroups a bit later. So the word protist is currently used as an informal catch-all term. So we now have the three domains of life. Based on fundamental molecular differences among bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, biologists currently classify organisms into three domains, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. So, systemists have inferred that the three domains are three main branches of life. New data suggests that many core genes of eukaryotes came from archaea, and the data support the hypothesis that an archaean was the host cell of the endosymbiosis that led to the evolution of eukaryotes. So, the hypothesized partnership between archaea and bacteria suggests that all life can be classified into a two domain system, with eukaryotes being a subgroup. Well, all right. So some biologists are moving away from the Linnaean category, categories because modern biologists are interested in having classifications of living organisms reflect the patterns of relatedness as closely as possible. Some of the terminology that has been used for, for decades is either being put aside or redefined. In addition, our increased ability to investigate DNA sequences of organisms and improved techniques for, anal for analyzing the molecular data are providing <coughs> excuse me, 
many new discoveries regarding the patterns of relatedness among living species. So we are in the midst of a time of transition. Next. So systemicists use phylogenetic trees to graphically represent hypothesized evolutionary relationships among organisms and those that have a common ancestor. So in figure 23.2, which you can now see here, we use a phylogenetic tree to illustrate the relationship between the three domains of life and the phylogenetic tree in V23 illustrates the main branches that make up the three domains. So this is figure 23.3 that I'm showing you now. This tree is one of the current versions of the tree of life. So you can see domain bacteria with proteobacteria, cyanobacteria, the gram-positive bacteria, the chlamydias, the spirochetes, domain archaea with urearchaeota and crinarchaeota, and then we have from there the domain eukarya with excavates, the chromobile alveoles, the rhizarians, the red algae, the green algae, the land plants, fungi, coenoflagellates, and animals. And this is actually leading me to think about those five supergroups as I go through those. So each type of phylogenetic tree we use in this book is called a cladogram. Each branch in a cladogram represents a clade, which is a group of organisms with a common ancestor. And each branching point referred to as a node, depicted by a circle, and represents the divergence or splitting of two or more groups from a common ancestor. Thus, the node represents the most recent common ancestor of each clade depicted by the branches. In this way, a cladogram uses positions of branch points to illustrate the hypothesized evolutionary relationships among taxa. Each of the branches is formed based on evidence in terms of observable traits that are shared by the organisms at the end of the branch, but are not found in organisms on other branches. These shared characteristics can be indicated by labels or by bars across the branches. So cladograms are rooted by the most recent common ancestor, if the most recent common ancestor is known. So the root or node at the base of the cladogram represents the most recent common ancestor of all clades, of all clades, such as you would see here at the very bottom. I guess I'll move this mouse. So this tree is rooted right there with the most recent common ancestor of all living things. And then from there, we have this node here making this a clade. We have this node here making that a clade, just as this is a clade. And then we have this node here representing all eukaryotes being a clade because of this. Let us continue. Let us continue. So when we think of how organisms acquire their genes, we think of vertical gene transfer, in which genes are transferred from parent to offspring within the same species. We also usually attribute similarities among species and their heritable traits to, the, to be the result of shared ancestry or homology. For example, if two species share the same sequence of nitrogenous bases in their DNA for a particular gene, we hypothesize that this sharing is due to two species have inherited a particular gene from the same ancestor. So as biologists have continued to investigate the evolution of genes, they have discovered that in some cases the inheritance can occur outside of the parent-offspring pathway. With horizontal gene transfer, gene swapping takes place between one genome and another within one taxon or between genomes in different taxa. In this process, genes move from one individual to another individual species in the same generation. So one way horizontal gene transfer has occurred is in karyotes is by endosymbiosis, a process in which one organism lives inside one cell of another organism, and one and the two become dependent on each other. And over time, such relationships 
result in a complete loss of the separate identity of the symbiotes. In fact, eukaryotic cells are most likely evolved from prokaryotic cells that live symbiotically within one another. Well, all right, reconstructing evolutionary history. So a major goal of systematics is to reconstruct phylogeny, the evolutionary history of a group of organisms from a common ancestor. So in their efforts, systemists must employ a wide range of evidence from shared traits to geographic distributions to positions in strata and must incorporate our best understandings of evolutionary processes. So as systemists determine the evolutionary relationships among species in higher taxa, they build classifications based on the patterns of shared ancestry. So systematics is at the center of how we study and explain the patterns of similarities and relationships of life forms on Earth. So given this, I'm going to move on down through the chapter and end things in just a moment. So features that were present in an ancestral species and remain present in all groups descended from that ancestor. And here I'm getting those shared derived characters. So systemists use shared derived characters to identify points where groups diverge from another and know traits that evolve when two populations separate and begin to evolve independently. So species that share shared derived characters form a clade. So a clay can also be referred to as a monophyletic group. Another word for a clade. And given this, I'm trying to get to another point in the lecture to show you. Bingo. Here we are with evolutionary relationships. So it first mentions that based on molecular data, systemists confirm or modify the work of earlier biologists constructing cladograms to reflect evolutionary relationships among clades. So cladograms show three types of taxonomic relationships. So the monophyletic group includes the ancestral species and all of its descendants. A paraphyletic group is a group that contains a common ancestor and some but not all of the descendants. And a polyphyletic group consists of several evolutionary lines that do not share the same recent common ancestor. And you will see this on your test, so let's get to it. So what you have here being shown to you is figure 23-7. Again, I say this is figure 23-7, and this is figure 23-7-A. So this is the model for the group. It includes an ancestral species and all descendants. So they're defined by those shared derived characters. And what I mean is, is from A, you have everything that you see here being a monophyletic group. So A, including everything here, is a monophyletic group. But I could also say that with C, C would be the common ancestor of taxa 2 and 3. So that would be a mon monophyletic group. And I guess to go back to A, it is the common ancestor of all taxa shown. But if I go over to node D as in dog, it is a common ancestor of taxa 4, 5, and 6. So that is also a monophyletic group. So in this, you have given to yourselves three examples of monophyletic groups. So you have A and everything there, node A and everything you see. You have node C, which includes 2 and 3, taxa 2 and 3. And you have node D as in dog, including taxa 4, 5, and 6. The paraphyletic group, again, contains the common ancestor and some, but not all, descendants. So if I were to use node D, D as in dog, as the common ancestor, so here we only will include, however, taxa 4 and 5. In other words, so use my mouse, we have D, which would include E, 4 and 5, so you have some well, they have a common ancestor, D. Common ancestor, D. And some, but not all, descendants. Which is why this is the paraphyletic group. So taxa 4 and 5 make that paraphyletic group. And then lastly, we have the 
poly for the group. And in case you don't see it here, let me pause and enter I say this overtly. We did not include taxon number six, which is why this is a para for the group. And I'll have to go back one step. We could do the same thing with node C. We would say C including taxon 2, C including taxon 2, and that would be a pair for the group as well because we have some but not all the sentence of C. And we could also go from A, meaning A being the most recent common ancestor, and go around B and go from taxon 1, 2, and 3, or taxa 1, 2, and 3, and we still have some but not all descendants. Paraphyletic groups, those are. And then lastly here, we have the polyphyletic group. So in this example of that polyphyletic group, we only include taxa 3 and 5. So here, there are no recent common ancestors that are shared. They do not share the same recent common ancestor, only those two descendants with no recent common shared ancestor. So this has been chapter 23. If you have any questions about anything in this chapter, please reach out. You may also see the summer in focus on this chapter called 23. Take care of yourselves, study well, and this has been your instructor, Scholar Huff. Thank you all for listening.